where do we find the truth? In the Word of God. That's where we find out what truth is. This is where we find out if our theology lines up with God's truth. So friends, we uh, continue our message series uh, called Staying True in a World Far from God. Uh, and we're on week three, uh, and today we're talking about speaking truth boldly. But I want to remind you that with each series, we do try to memorize a, a verse or two together. And the one that we're memorizing now is Daniel 10, 12. We say it twice during the worship service. Uh, so if you'll join me starting and ending with the reference, uh, Daniel 10, 12, do not be afraid. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Daniel 10, 12. And then we make some letters disappear each week. Uh, it kind of feels a little bit like Sesame Street to me sometimes, but we're going to do it, right? Join me again. Daniel 10, 12. Do not be afraid. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. Daniel 10, 12. Um, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I remember, and maybe you do too, but I absolutely remember the first time I heard a cuss word on TV. I remember the show. I, I remember the scene. And, and, and I, this is what I remember thinking. Oh, my I hope dad did not hear that because I want to keep watching the show. I mean, that's, that's what I remember happening. My, my dad, he wasn't necessarily paying attention to it or he didn't hear the word or whatever it was. We got to keep watching the show. And you're all wondering, what's the show? What's the show uh, where you heard your first swear word on TV? Well, Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> I'm just letting you know, it was Little House on the Prairie. And you're going, what? Little House on the Prairie. I mean, that's one of the good shows. Well, yeah, we, 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 we thought it was a great show, but they ended up starting to swear on that show. And, 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 and so, you know, I was, I was nervous that, that we, uh, <clears throat> we couldn't watch this because here's what I knew in my house. If I would have said the word that was said on Little House on the Prairie, I would look like Ralphie on the screen right now. My parents did put soap in our mouths when we said things that weren't appropriate. So we, I did not say those words for fear that I would get some soap in my mouth. And I don't know if you know this, uh, but there's this, there's this organization out there, the, the Federal Communications Commission, and, and, and their job kind of is, is to help us, help, help keep control of what is being aired, and, and, and to make sure that they're not doing anything indecent, obscene, or obscene or profane. And for them, each of those has a different definition. And, and so, so what they do is, is if something's going to be aired, radio, TV, these days streaming, um, they, will, they will try to check these things and determine if it's okay to be aired aired where you want them to be aired and at what times those were being aired. And, and so back then, if, if they found something that they didn't seem appropriate, um, they would contact the producers and say, that's not going to be able to be aired. And here's the things you would need to change in order to have it aired. Or you can, you can show this after 8 p.m. at night. Or what, what the, kind of the recent thing is, is, is we have these ratings on the things that we watch. Uh, so here's kind of what's happened with the FCC as I see it. It seems that, that back then, you know, I say back then, uh, they were ahead of the game and people would submit to them the things that they want to see if they're appropriate. Now they're, they're kind of playing catch up. And, and they don't really check shows unless the community around him, unless our culture Culture, um, starts to verbally complain about the things that they are hearing or seeing. And, and, if, and if the community starts to complain about it, the FCC will jump in, they'll check to see what's going on, and they'll start to create some, some barriers, some guidelines for the people as they move forward. And, and so we've gone to this place where we had somebody who was determining what is obscene and profane and indecent, to now just the community is making that decision. And, and, and it's not just the community when it comes, when it comes to what's being aired. It, it is also um, advertisers. Because advertisers, you know, they would be the ones who said, we don't like what you're showing, so we're not going to give you the money to help you show it. And so now the people that are producing these things, uh, they have to listen to what the community wants and what the advertisers, the people with money want. And it gets us to this place where almost anything goes or, or the community is, is deciding what is best for us, which means that we are a long, long ways away from Ricky, Ricardo, and Lucy <laughs> sleeping in separate beds together to what we see today. I mean, it's kind of crazy what we see. And, and, but, but it's this idea that we, if, if we let p culture decide which way we are going to head forward, uh, then, then I love the, the John Wesley quote, quote where he says, uh, what one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. 
You know what that means? What I let my children watch and see on TV and in the community, it, it just becomes a part of who they are. What my parents let us watch became a part of who I was. And, and so we have to understand that we are responsible for what the generation around us and the generation to come is, is watching. It's what they're listening to. And, and how do we engage and, and step into this? Well, the passage of scripture that we're heading to today, um, we're, we're in Daniel chapter 5, and, and just to try and give you a little bit of backup, uh, there's this king, Nebuchadnezzar, who reigned, and, and, and Daniel helped him to, to uh, understand some dreams that he had. Well, so, so that king now um, has been dead for 23 years as we get to chapter 5. Uh, and, and in the time between, all, there were a whole bunch of other kings, um, and each king, it seemed, was e more evil than the one before it. And, and you had kids who were, <laughs> were killing parents, right? And then you had relatives who were killing these people just so that they could keep getting to the throne and getting to the throne and getting to the throne until we get to where we are today, where there's this guy named Belshazzar who actually isn't the king. Uh, his dad is, but, the, but the dad, his dad does not want to, to live there. And so he says, I'm going to go move somewhere else. Belshazzar, you are now the regent, which kind of means you're the king of this area. So, so now you have this young man, as, as I imagine, who's king. And, 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 uh, and so now he is in, in charge. He's super excited to be in charge. He decides to, to, to throw the party of parties. And, and, and so he gathers 1,000, scripture said, 1,000 noble Babylonians and, and brings them in for this huge party. And, and, and as you could imagine, when you have this huge party going on, things, things start to degrade a little bit, right? Now it's a drunken stupor. And, and, and scripture alludes to the fact that, that, that you know, orgies and stuff started taking place uh, when this is happening. And, and Belshazzar, uh, whose name, because I always say that names are kind of important, Belshazzar's name means the god Bel, Bel you know, which is a, one of the gods that, that he worshipped. Bel, protect this king. So that's what Belshazzar means. Um, and I think that comes into play later as we hear about what's going on. Okay, so, so Belshazzar, he says, let's up this party a little bit. Uh, I, I remember that there are these gold goblets and, and, and stuff that, that, is, that is set in the, in the things of Nebuchadnezzar um, let, that, that they took from the temple in Jerusalem. Let's grab those things and let's use those for the party. So he sends people to go get these sacred things that were used in the temple of God. And, and, and they grab the stuff and they, they start filling it with wine and they're drinking and the party is continuing. But we find out that God had had enough. And, and, and so God, in, in, in a very interesting way, he, he sends a human hand, which I always think of Adam's family. And so I, I see the thing running across the floor, climbing up on the wall. But however God did it, right? God said, said suddenly the fingers of a hand appeared uh, and, and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. And the king watched as, uh, as the hand wrote. And, and his face turns pale and frightened and his legs became weak, uh, which which sometimes in scripture means he pooped his pants. So, so he is so frightened about what's going on. And it says, and his knees were knocking. And so, so this is going on. The hand is writing something. He, can't, he doesn't understand it. Nobody in the room understands it. So he starts calling in uh, the astrologers and, and all the wise people. And they say, can you read this? Can you help me to understand what it is? And they're all saying, no, we have no idea uh, what it is. Uh, and, and so this commotion is going on, right? And the queen mother, his mom, uh, walks in the room uh, to start telling him, you know, I, I, I do know that there is this one guy who 63 years earlier, I mean, that, that's, the time, that's the time frame that we're looking at to chapter 5, and, and which should hopefully help us as we have more birthdays to realize that Daniel, who's around 80 now, um, still is being used by God, which is a powerful, powerful thing for us to be thinking about. And so, so the queen mother comes in and she says, there's this guy, right, in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods. She didn't know how to describe it the, the way that Daniel would have, right? So that's the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time your father, now when it's talking about father, it actually means predecessor, right? So, so it's the line of kings who are on the throne. So every time you hear father, it's kind of like that, the, the line to the throne. Uh, uh, your, your predecessor, he was found to have insight uh, and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. And, and your father, your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar appointed him as chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and, and diviners. All right, so, so there's this guy out there who probably can answer your question. And that's where we get into our story today. Lord God, would you please open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to hear the things that you want us to hear. Lord, this is one of those challenging things where, where, where we... <laughs> 
You're calling us to stand and speak the truth boldly. And I think we're in a culture that doesn't enjoy that. And so help us to even navigate those things, God, as, as we learn from your word on how we can best honor you with our lives. And may the words that I share and the things that we all hear be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, for you are our rock and our blessed redeemer. Amen. Okay, so, so she says, there's this guy. Uh, and, and he's got the wisdom of the gods in him. And so they call Daniel forward. So Daniel's being brought to the king. And the king says to him, are you Daniel, right? The one the exiles, my predecessor, the king, uh, brought from Ju Judah. Are you actually that person? I've heard that you have the spirit of the gods is in you. And that you have I insight and intelligence and outstanding wis wisdom. And so he's kind of buttering him up. I don't know why. He's, he's the king of the area, right? But he's buttering Daniel up. And he says, the wise men, the enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means. They couldn't explain it. They could not figure it out. So now I have heard that you, Daniel, you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you'll be clothed in purple, have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So, so, so what, what is happening here? All the other, uh, all the other wise men, they, they couldn't figure it out. But the queen mother remembers that there was this man who was different than every, and every, everyone else. This guy's name is Daniel. He was actually put in charge of all these people you're asking the question. Why? Because he was able to, to determine and, and answer visions to which Daniel said, it wasn't me, right? When he was asked by Nebuchadnezzar, can you, can you tell me my dream? He says, nobody can tell you your dream, but God can. And Daniel lived for God. As we see in scripture, because in Daniel, it kind of bounces back and forth a little bit in there, that Daniel is just living for God as best he knows how throughout his life, learning and growing. And so it seems to me that, that this person of integrity um, was remembered. Why? Because he was a person of integrity. Because he had this wisdom that God had given him, that he sought to speak and share the things of God. It, it got me thinking uh, about this article I, I came across in the Atlantic where, where um, David Brooks, he was, you know, this came out last year, uh, David Brooks, he he took some research uh, that was, was done on people, and, and he found out some, some really, really startling things. In, in, in the article, he decides to ask two questions um, just, to, just to help the article go on. And, and the first question he asks is, is, why have Americans become so sad? And, and in the article, he talks about how, how over half of the United States, uh, the people that were, that were uh, responded to this survey, over half the United States said that there isn't anybody in this world that really knows them just don't feel like anyone knows them. And then there was a startling article, or part of the article that I saw, where, where he said high school students, they're reporting persistent feelings of hopelessness. Oh my goodness. Up to 44% is happening. Nearly half our kids in school don't see hope with what's going on. And so then the second question that he asks is, is why has America gotten so mean? Um, and, and so he's talking about it. He's talking about, you know, social media and that there's these sociological, there's economic and demographic factors. There are reasons because of pe where people live, uh, because of what the resources that, that, that they have, that there are these reasons why people are angry. But then he said that he believes that, that there is a much simpler reason th than, than all the stuff that he's talking about. And, and please hear this, friends. He said, we inhabit a society in which people are no longer trained in how to treat others with kindness and consideration. We're not teaching people to do that anymore is what he's saying. Our society has become one in which people feel licensed to give their selfishness free reign. I, we, we, we say that everyone can just think and feel and be and do as they want. We've given that license to people. And, and so, so what's happening in our world is, is people are living a world about themselves and themselves only. He says, in a healthy society, a web of institutions Families, schools, religious groups, friend, that's us. Community organizations and workplaces helps form people into the kind and responsible citizens, the sort of people that show up for one another. That's what happens in a healthy society. And he said, we live in a society that's terrible at moral formation. So here's what he's saying. Schools, religious groups, right? Community organizations, we're not teaching people what it means to be kind, 
and people of integrity. And that was what mattered back then, and we just don't do it anymore. And that's why we feel this sense of hopelessness in our world. And, and, and how people in their anger will lash out on social media. And sometimes you wonder why. It's because we have not been taught those things. Daniel is now living in a culture where this was no longer taught. And, 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 and so they're doing whatever they want. But when they needed someone to help them, who are they going to look to if not themselves? Somebody with integrity. Somebody with godly wisdom. Oh, there was this guy, Daniel. Yeah, he's 80 now, but, but the man still knows his stuff. Let's bring him in. Find out what he has to say. And so, and so that's what happens. Daniel answers the king. So are you Daniel? He said, uh, you know, if you, if you, can, if you can read this and, and explain it to me, I will give you all these crazy gifts. You'll be third in charge. My dad's the king. I'm the king of this place, and you would be in charge of everything. Okay? And, and so Daniel answers. He says, you may you just keep your gifts, right? Uh, keep, keep them to yourself. Give your reward to someone else. Um, I, I won't answer this because you're giving me something. That, that, that's what Daniel is saying, right? But nevertheless, nevertheless he said, I will read the writing uh, for the king. And tell him what it means. Now, in, in when, when Chuck read the scripture, we jump forward to, to verse 22. Um, and, and there's some stuff that goes on there, which I'll get to in just a second. But you got to see what Daniel is doing here as we go back. He says, but you, Belshazzar, you, uh, the God Bell, protect this king, right? Uh, so you, the one who you believe that this, guy, this God is going to protect you, right? You haven't humbled yourself. Though you knew all this. So what is all of this that Belshazzar knew, but it didn't affect who he was? All right, so now let's go back and see that. So, so when Daniel's answering him, he says, Your majesty, he's talking to Belshazzar, Your majesty, the most high God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. So, so Nebuchadnezzar, when he realizes that the one true God is the God, you know, and, and there's no others, because that's what happened, God blessed him. Now, now, does that God do that with everyone? Maybe not to the exact same extent, but I do believe God blesses us when we hum humble ourselves before him. Right? And so that happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Belshazzar, you know this, right? Uh, because of the high position that he gave him, all the nations and peoples, every language dreaded and feared him. Why? Because he had power over, over nations, because God allowed him to have that. And those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death, right? Those he wanted to spare, he spared. The promote, he promoted them. Those he wanted to humble, he humbled him. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, he had amazing, amazing power and authority because God had given it to him. But... It says, when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, arrogant means I don't need to listen to other people. Hardened with pride means that it's all about what I want. When that happened to Nebuchadnezzar, right, he was deposed from the royal throne. He was stripped of his glory. God said, enough. You are not being a great example to the people around you is, is kind of what God's saying. Enough. And it says, he was driven away from the people, given the mind of an animal, right? He lived with a wild donkey and ate grass like an ox. And so, so it's imagined that he was, he was a goat because his body was drenched with dew of heaven. And so, so he ends up this animal who's living like an animal. Crazy stuff, right? But Belshazzar, you know this. You know that he was somebody who trusted God and then decided to just trust in himself in the things that he wanted. And it wasn't until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms and all the earth and sets over them anyone he wishes, then he was stuck as an animal. When he surrendered himself to God, God restored him. And so this really interesting thing has happened, but Belshazzar, you know this, and you're choosing not to humble yourself. You know that God has blessed you with, with the authority, uh, with, with the, the people around you. Uh, God has blessed you with all these things. But you're not humbling yourself. Though you knew what happened to your predecessor, and you're just ignoring what was taught to you. Ugh, talk about a slap in the face, huh? They called Daniel in. They wanted to hear what, what this meant, and Daniel had to help him to know what this means is that God, the one true God, has something that we all need to hear, especially you, Belshazzar, and your king is not going to protect you. Your God is not going to protect you. He said, instead of humbling yourself, 
You set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You made it all about you, what you want, how I want to live my life, as opposed to how God wants me to live my life. So, and you put yourself uh, up against the Lord of the heaven. <laughs> and that comes into play later. He said, you had the goblets from this temple, the sacred stuff of God. You knew it was sacred, and you just brought them in and did whatever you wanted. So, so it's the idea for us today is, is we know that there are these sacred things of God. And what do we do with them? Do we just come and use them and abuse them as we want? Or, or are we seeing these things or our time or our space or, or the people around us as gifts from God, Right? You have the goblets from the temple brought to you, to you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines, um, uh, and they drank wine from them. The sacred stuff, you just use whenever you wanted, however you wanted, and that's not okay. He says, you praise the gods of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wooden stove, uh, uh, wooden and stone, um, which the, the whole, as they were gathering, they were talking about how great their gods were. I forgot to mention that. My apologies. And so Daniel's come in and said, you're saying that all these gods are great, right? You praise them. But these gods cannot see or understand. All right, so I'm just going to take a little break here. And I'm just going to come out in the audience. Is that all right? Anyone scared of this? Good. Good. I just want to introduce some people. That's it. Can, uh, can I introduce you guys? What are your names? Ted. Gail. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted and Gail. Which is really interesting, because when my name's uh, said in the service, nobody claps. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Can I, sit? Can I introduce you? You okay with that? What's your name? Spencer. I don't know your last name. Dono? Ladies and gentlemen, Spencer Dono. Woo. I mean, this is, this is working about as good as you could imagine, right? Uh, can I introduce you guys? Is that all right? All right, and your names are? Ladies and gentlemen, Paul and Janet Berger. Yeah, super great. Super awesome. I, I, I love the fact that you are here. Uh, are you okay if I introduce you? All right. And your name is? Jana. Jana. Geetes. Ladies and gentlemen, Jana Geetes. Yeah. Jana, can I ask you a few other questions? Sure. Would you be willing, and, and I'll, I'll have you do it in this year, would you be willing to tell me your deepest, most embarrassing sin that you've committed? Go ahead. What? <laughs> did you say, did you say no? No, come on, come on, go ahead. No, come on. Uh, you've got to be kidding. Go ahead, keep telling me. <laughs> they were wearing what? Come on, come on, come on. I, I, I got to hear the end of this. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, uh, so all of that kind of makes sense, but help me to understand what the monkeys were for, okay? <laughs> wow. Can I tell everyone the story? Uh, no, she doesn't want me to. Does that, do you find that surprising? Do you find it surprising that a story where you just got bits and pieces and you're all saying, what's going on? I want to hear the story. What were the monkeys for? How does that tie into sin? If I can be honest, she didn't say anything like that, and she didn't know I was doing it, so if we don't see Jana next week, it's probably <laughs> my fault, all right? Um, but when we think about uh, sharing the truth boldly, what we often think that it has to be done loudly, and I don't think that that's what God is teaching us, and I don't think that's what Daniel is showing us here. Is that we're not, we're not called to share this loudly. We're, we're not called to do this in such a way that's, that's to shame and embarrass people. But we are called to open people's eyes to the truth of the fact that, that, that sin involves exalting ourselves over God. It, it's the, the key thing in this world. And if you think about any and every sin that we do, in, in all those situations, what we are doing is, is we are putting ourselves up against God, just like Belshazzar was doing here. And, and we're thinking that, that what we do is more important, which tips the scale. What, what we do is more important than what God is telling us to do. And, and so that's what Daniel's trying to share with him, trying to get him to understand. You, you, you uh, praise these gods who can't see or hear you, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. God is the one who has you in his hand. 
And he's inviting us to acknowledge him as God. And Belshazzar, you're not doing it. And I got to let you know, your God, Bel, will not protect the king if you're not willing to humble yourself before God. See, God holds us in his hands. And it, it, this actually reminds me of the, the love that God has and, and the reminder that God is in control. I, I, I see it in Psalm 139 where he says, uh, my, your eyes saw my unformed body before I was even born, right? Before I was even born, your days were, my days were ordained for me. They were written in this book before any of them ever happened. That's how much God knows us. That's how much God cares for us, that he knows exactly what's going to go on in your life through eternity and he cares about you and he cares about me and that's why in proverbs 3 it reminds us that in all our ways we're supposed to submit acknowledge humble ourselves to him because god will make our paths straight he's the one that has the best plan for each and every one of our lives and i think that that's what god wants us to speak boldly the truth that it's not about us. It's about us, God, hum, us humbling ourselves before God. But it's all about God. And any time you put yourself in competition with God, what's going to happen to the scale? We think we get to decide. But the reality is, is no, nope, God already has the plan of our life and how it's going to play out. And are we willing to trust him or fight him through it all? Daniel's telling Belshazzar, that's what you're doing, is you're fighting through it all. You didn't honor God, the one who holds you in his hand. So he says, um, that's why God sent this hand. That's why God wrote the inscription on the wall. And he says, this is the inscription as it was written, right? Meeny, meeny, tekel, parson. Um, and and so, so this is what's written on the wall, and Daniel says, here's what the words mean, because this is what you want to know. <laughs> he should have said, and you're not going to like it. But when we put ourselves up against God, and the reality is, is who's the one that's sovereign? It's God. We think we are, but the reality is, is we are not. It's God. And we can choose to just ignore him or trust him. This is what the words mean. Uh, meanie, uh, which was actually said twice. And, and anytime something's said twice in Scripture, I think it's to remind us that this deserves some very, very important, urgent, immediate attention. And it says, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to, to an end. Um, so, so Belshazzar knew this, but the Medes and the Persians, they were actually gathering together and, and, uh, because they were, they were thinking that they were going to come and take over the, the, the kingdom that Belshazzar was in charge of. And he knew this. As a matter of fact, they were outside the walls of the city. And Belshazzar says, I don't care. I'm going to have a party. Because it's all about what I want, not what's happening in the world around me. I just want a party. I just want to do whatever I want. Well, God has numbered your days. Hey, pay attention. God has numbered your days. He said it twice, trying to get his attention. Right? Uh, Tekel, uh, you have been weighed on the scales, and you've been found wanting. You think that it's all about you, but it's not. You can't even tip the scale in your direction compared to God. And he says Paris, which is different than Parson. Parson is plural, this is singular. And it's almost like he's trying to point Belshazzar out specifically in this, although everyone was doing it, but, it, but it's just this image. You're the one who's in charge. You're the one who invited all these people, and this is your community, and you're showing them how you live instead of how God is calling us to live. So hear this out. Your kingdom is divided and it's given to the Medes and the Persians. And you know what happens? The very next day, they are attacked and overthrown. Can you believe it? And all of this was because one person chose to not surrender himself to God and made himself more important, thinking that he could decide what life could be like. And Daniel steps in to say that's not how it plays out. And so Daniel, the, the picture for all of us and how we can think about this as we move forward is Daniel was willing to step into a situation that he was invited into. And as he was invited into that, that, that situation, that conversation, he spoke the truth of God boldly. Well, you want to have this conversation? All right, well, I'm just going to tell you the reality of the situation. 
Jesus is the only way to be in a relationship with the Heavenly Father, and without him, we will experience eternity in hell. You want to talk about this, I would be happy to talk about it with you. Thank you. But that's what's most important. I, I, I close with what, what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 1 as he was beginning to, he was trying to help uh, the Gentiles, which are anyone not Jewish, but he's talking to the Roman world, and, and, and he's trying to help them to understand this gospel matters. And he says, I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I'm not going to be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation. That's it. That is what the gospel is, the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. If we are willing uh, to, to see ourselves in need of a Savior because we've struggled, we've failed, we've made life about ourselves at times or always, uh, which this is called sin, and, and when that happens, we are found lacking, and we need a Savior. We need a way for us, uh, some sort of sacrifice to make that right. And God sent his son Jesus who was willing to die on the cross for our sin perfect, sinless Son of God. And he rose again, showing that he truly is God. And those who believe in him, we are saved and invited into this life where he is the one is sovereign in all that we do and in all that we say. It's the power of God that brings first to the, first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. He was helping the, the Gentiles to understand that, that yeah, the, this happened for the Jews, but this is really for everybody. He said, in the, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. We, we discover God's goodness, God's faith, God's love for us because of the gospel, because of what Christ has done. And that righteousness uh, that is by faith, first to last, just as it's written, he says, the righteous will live by faith. As we trust in Christ, God helps us to live the way that he wants us to live. And the scales begin tipping towards our Savior. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful picture? But in the midst of it, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that sin in our lives leads to judgment. And that also leads to judgment to the world around us. So what Daniel's showing us, I believe, today is, is when we get invited into these conversations or we choose to enter into some sort of conversation, we be the ones that are standing on the truth of Christ in all things. Lord God, Thank you for, for this challenge so hard for me to realize, so hard for me to put into practice. And yet, this is what you're calling us to do. So, Lord, would you take us a, a people and, and help us to understand what it means to come to know you, what it means to give our lives to you, Lord, what it means that Jesus died for us. And help us to say yes to that, God. And may we trust you in the midst of the life that we are living to be able to stand on your truth and speak it boldly. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this week's message. We hope you found it both encouraging and helpful. If you did, please click the like button and share with your friends. If you want to hear when new messages are posted, please subscribe to The Benton Church. We also invite you to join us on site for worship. We're located in Benton, Kansas, just east of Wichita. Our Sunday services start at 1030 and our doors are open to everyone. For more information, please check out our website at thebentonchurch.org. What do you know about God? He loves us. He died for our sins. He helps us. He's powerful. And he loves you.